On Computerfile, we just love provocative and mysterious titles. And carrying on from the last time we spoke, let's say this is going to be a chat about what came to be called the Uncall problem. Universal Computer Language, I think it stands for. It was more specific than just any old computer language. It was, is there a unique intermediate language which would suit everybody, you know? Not as high as C even, and not quite down at the absolute binary level, but more like a sort of absolutely universal assembler, a pseudo-assembler. It, it's not really hardware implemented on any machine, but it's, it's one that we can all work with. And every compiler in the whole world all they would have to do is produce the uncall language, if we can only agree what it is, and then every system could talk to every other system at this agreed low level. Well, as you can imagine, it doesn't work like that. Uh, it very soon became ob obvious that, yes, this business of putting a level in there and saying we'll all compile to intermediate code is fine. But when you start looking at what facilities it should have, what facilities it shouldn't have, you're up against the fact that computer hardware designers like to do things their own way. I mean, numbers of registers might be 16, it might be fewer, that's no big deal. Um, some of them arrange those registers in a formal or informal stack, others don't. Should we always assume that we have stack capabilities? And I think as somebody pointed out to me, I think Ron, Ron Knott, who originally created these notes, he said, the thing in the end that kills you is that they all do input-output differently. There's almost no agreement about how you do I.O. So fairly soon the idea of finding one unique intermediate language had to be forgotten about but the idea of different intermediate languages at different levels of sophistication really did gain traction in the 1980s. We mentioned that Steve Bourne had his Z code as part of his Alcohol 68 project way back in the early 80s. A little bit later on, I think it was in the 80s, many of you will know this one better, James Gosling developed the language Java in which he decided that pointers were dangerous and should be hidden, but therein lies another story. But the big thing that James made a feature of was to say, I want my Java systems to compile down to what he called bytecode. In other words, it was a sort of pseudo-assembler with really like single byte opcodes like A and Z and whatever. Um, and yes, bytecode became flavor of the month. We all go down to bytecode. Well, then what do you do? Well, you've got choices. You could either write an interpreter for bytecode, um, <clears throat> which will be easy to change. It will be a little slow, a bit big. If you really care passionately about having the ultimate super fast and efficient binary, you could always compile the bytecode. Um, get it smaller and all that. So you had options. But the idea was that, yes, you would have an intermediate code. Even so, it's not a one size fits all. There's still, it was ideal for what James wanted to do, but its extensibility to be a universal panacea, not so. You see, let me give you another good example of why some people might want to move the semantic barrier a bit higher. I mean, bytecode is fairly low level. What about if we move it up so we're getting more airy-fairy? Heaven knows, you might encounter Haskell way up there somewhere. Classic example, of course, is the development of C++. And as many of you know, as its name implies, it goes beyond C. It adds classes and all sorts of other features to C. And the idea from Bjarne Strustrup, the inventor, was that to get something going in the first instance, at least, he would, of course, do the obvious thing. He, his compiler would compile C++ down to C. And then you could put it just through an ordinary C compiler for the back end. So you see, his uncle is at a much higher level of sophistication than pseudo-assembler type bytecode level. And you might say, oh, well, that's great. I mean, it obviously suits C++ to do that. Yes, it did, but there are 
big problems with this approach. Once you broadcast the fact that actually C++, your Mark 1 compiler, is producing C under the hood, you will have the devil's own job in convincing benevolent hackers who think they can generate better C code than Bjarne Struestrup can, getting in behind the scenes and messing about with the way he does classes, for example. So I suppose what I'm saying more generally about this is that very often you will have a very good solution for a language system to establish a bridgehead and to get something working. But in the longer run, you might want a more direct version that isn't as prone to hacker intrusion, gross abuse, or just things going a bit wrong because of the nature of the intermediate language being so rich and having a mind of its own. Now, you might say, well, that can't be an issue, can it? Yes, it can, um, because this whole question of level of your intermediate code this thing gets me there. Why do I need to go direct? Let me give you another example. Not C++ this time. Another well-known example for many of you is PDF. It's been so well established for so long now, since 1989, that many of you using it will not know that in the early days it came off the back of Adobe's very successful language called PostScript. And PostScript was there, as you know, as the universal graphics language. It uh, drove laser printers, it drove whatever. It's a wonderful achievement. In order to get a PDF, the way you did it originally was you compiled your PostScript with an Adobe provided utility called Distiller. But the problem was, in many ways, it was very graphically sophisticated, but it was Turing complete. You could do anything in it, and indeed, I often thought, well, the next program I write in PostScript, before I do any typesetting as ordered by the customer, I will get my program to solve Ackerman's function first. Can you imagine the delay? I'm sorry, I'm going to compute Ackerman 3.1 before I turn my attention to doing your miserable little piece of typesetting. But in principle, you could have done that as long as it didn't run out of memory. But, you know, I'm just saying this to make the silly point that that's perfectly doable. You sometimes found that your PDF produced out of compiling PostScript in Distiller was yards bigger than the input. Not very often, but sometimes. So there again, you see, in order to stop abuse and to point the way to the future, Adobe very quickly said, what we must do for those that don't know about PostScript, have no need for it, is to give a direct route to PDF, and they called it PDF Writer back in the early days. And then, of course, people not wanting to be bound into Adobe quite rightly said, fabulous, what we need to do is to replicate something of what Distiller does. We'll write utilities with names like PS2 PDF, which you will typically find in uh, PostScript offerings on Linux and all this kind of stuff. But it makes the point that very often that directness of approach gives you a good result and stops people messing about under the hood and doing things which are ridiculous and expensive. If you start saying no from now on, it's much quicker to go direct. We know how to do it. Let's do it. Let's keep it clean. So that is, I guess, I think a, a feature still. I keep reading stories of people using intermediate codes for compiling programming languages who suddenly say, well, 20 years down the line, we think uh, intermediate codes are bad. It's far better to do it direct in some other way. And all you can say out of this is that every time you get into porting software, you learn something every time about the pros and cons of having an intermediate representation, or do you jump over it and go direct? There is no universal right answer. The more you look at the scene at the moment about program language implementation, the more you realise that a huge number of the offerings out there might look to you like straightforward point-to-point -point compilers, you know, I'm running on a 
whatever I'm running on at the moment. I'm running on an ARM chip. It's all self-hosted on the ARM chip. It compiles ARM code for further use on further ARM chips. It doesn't do anything else. Not true. If you look under the hood of GCC, of course, that Stallman and the GNU effort did such a wonderful job in creating for us GNU version of CC. When you look in there at the possible backends for different architectures, you realize it's really a cross compilation system. You can compile from anything to anything. Now, other people other than the GNU effort got there eventually and realized the same thing. I mean, I think Microsoft in the mid 80s did actually had the nerve to develop something that I think they called intermediate language. I don't know whether Microsoft did try and actually copyright the phrase intermediate language, but it's part of the same mindset. It's not just them that Apple and Steve Jobs always used to have. It may have existed, but it was done by a bunch of no-hopers. And until we discovered it, packaged it, marketed it and put it for you, you might as well think it never existed. <laughs> and that was Jobs through and through, but maybe all big computer companies have a little bit of this inside them. It didn't really exist in a usable way until we discovered it. Press an update variable A if I have the token. So let's bring back friendly Steve. So we've now got a token and we, what we're going to say is that unless I've got the token, I cannot mm -hmm. access the variable It delivers a. back the integer result in its local variable that it declares for itself for holding the answer. And eventually, of course, look, it's going to return 